Hello. <coughs> uh, can everybody hear me? Yes? No? I, louder. AV guy. Okay, we're good? Talk loud. All right, talk loud. I can do that. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, my name is Matt Ray. I'm the director of partner integration for Chef Software. Uh, we're the company that makes Chef. So what is Chef? If you're unfamiliar with Chef, who already knows? Like, because this session is not going to be an intro session. It's going to move pretty fast. Um, Chef is an open source framework for managing large scale infrastructure, for automating uh, the configuration of servers and uh, switches, as we'll learn. Um, but, it, but it is open source. And, and what's really uh, important about Chef is because we're open source, it's about the people, it's about the community, about the, the, the folks who work on it. Um, but uh, Chef itself is a declarative language for describing and configuring infrastructure. Um, you might say, well, how does Chef work? Uh, every, uh, every node that Chef manages, that's a node is typically like a server, um, it has a policy that you want applied to it. You say, this is the state I want my systems to have. I want uh, these users to be on there, these packages, this versions of the application, uh, those sort of things. Really simple declarations of what you want. And the Chef client is installed on those machines, and it's, go, it's gonna go and, and fetch that information from the server, uh, from the Chef server, and pull that and apply the policy that you want to those machines. Once it's applied that, that policy successfully, it's going to report it back to the, the server. Say, hey, uh, I'm now a LAMP stack and I've got all these things available to me and here's all the changes I made. And the server can index that for search. So other machines, when they need to find that information, they can say, hey, uh, where is the database or where's the load balancer or you know, whatever, whatever sort of information you need and you can do reporting and auditing against it. That's you know, in a nutshell, how things work. Uh, when we say that Chef is policy-based, it's because Chef has a, a domain-specific language that you use to describe the policy for your infrastructure, the desired state. You're saying, this is what I want things to be, and Chef, uh, and those policies can be dynamic. You can say, hey, I want my load balancer to balance all of the web apps. I don't need to know in advance how many there are. I'll go and search for them each time. And so Chef is going to ensure that the nodes in your infrastructure comply with that policy. Uh, this is what a Chef recipe looks like. Um, yeah, you can't see my pointer. Uh, but, uh, you know, package HTTPD. We're installing Apache on a Red Hat box. Uh, we've got a, a HTTP conf for the, the, uh, the box. It's a template. Uh, we use ERB. It's a fairly standard Ruby templating format. I'm saying I want this template filled out. Uh, there's a source, the owner, the group, uh, the permissions that I want on it. Here's a couple of variables I want to pass into it. And when you're done, I want to restart the HTTP service. So every time the Chef Agent runs, it's going to ensure that uh, Apache's installed, configured properly, and enabled and running. Fairly straightforward. That's uh, a Chef recipe. So Chef is built on the idea of infrastructure as code. If, uh, if you're familiar with uh, kind of one of the big principles in DevOps is the idea of automation and, and being able to, to recreate your infrastructure uh, programmatically. Infrastructure as code is the idea that everything you do in your infrastructure is tracked and source controlled. So a chef recipe represents everything that is, is changing in your, in your systems. How your Windows boxes are, in, are configured, your Linux boxes, your networking, all of that is tracked in source control, which can be versioned, checked into Git, you can diff it, you can share it, you can fork it, you can uh, version it. And, and what this allows you to do is once you have everything tracked in source control, you can re reconstruct your entire business with nothing but backups, your uh, repository, and access to new resources to replace those. So maybe you're moving from cloud infrastructure to cloud infrastructure. Maybe you're deploying the same thing in multiple data centers. Chef makes that sort of stuff easy. Uh, Chef has built-in resources for most of the things that a sysadmin would do on a box. Things like packages and groups and, and uh, routes and group and mounts and you know, sysadmin stuff. You know, anything a sysadmin would do on a box, you can do it. But because Chef is, is written in Ruby and we have these resources available to you, you can then extend uh, the, the, the functionality that you need with Ruby. So if 
perhaps you need to talk to an API to determine how to configure a system. Maybe you say to a database, hey, I need a list of all the uh, users that need to go into this configuration file. You can dynamically make that check every time the Chef client runs. So as your infrastructure changes, as pieces move around, as nodes come and go, as, as your uh, you know, ephemeral infrastructure uh, disappears, it's easy to reconfigure those things. Um, people use Chef to build just about anything and everything. Um, whether it's simple applications or you know, workstations, clusters, uh, IAS, passes, SASs, storage, you name it. <clears throat> and it makes it pretty easy to manage things at large scale. And when I talk about large scale, I'm talking about you know, companies like Facebook or Yahoo or uh, you know, those are pretty big companies. Um, and we support Linux, we support Windows, uh, Unixes, BSDs, uh, as well as switches and load balancers. Um, so uh, that's Chef in a really nut, uh, abbreviated nutshell. You know, but servers are great and all. Um, I mean, you know, that's, that's a big part of any infrastructure. Uh, and, and we scale, like I said, to de uh, deployments of hundreds of thousands of servers. Um, because the Chef server is not actually doing a lot of calculations, it's, it's a search engine. So search engines scale really well, and it's a fairly well-solved uh, well problem. Um, and we, we manage physical, virtual cloud instances. Uh, we're pretty agnostic about the operating system. We're agnostic about the, uh, where your infrastructure is running. We have support for just about every cloud I've ever heard of, uh, as well as you know, all the operating systems. And the servers are, are great and all, but you know, networking's a little different, right? I mean, networking's hard. You know, people don't want, uh, they don't want automation touching their networks because scary things happen. You know, you can, you can break things really fast if you misconfigure a switch. Um, instead of losing access to one machine, uh, you lose access to, you know, 48 or more. Um, but <clears throat> the advantages of infrastructure as code are the fact that everything you do on those systems is tracked. Every change can be tested. Everything can be uh, addressed before you get to deploying those, uh, those changes. Um, networking devices are kind of tricky. A lot of them don't have a user land. Um, but Chef has been ported to Linux and FreeBSD and NetBSD and OpenBSD. And a lot of network devices are either Linux or BSD based. So we have. Uh, uh, Chef is already cross-platform and already supports a lot of these operating systems, so we're porting Chef to these network devices, things that have a user land to, to manage. Things that don't have a user land, we're going to manage them remotely from their APIs. Not everything has great APIs. Uh, managing things through their APIs can be kind of lossy, and the fact that other devices could be managing them as well. You know, you could come in and make a bunch of API calls, and if Chef is not the source of truth for that, you lose some of the, the visibility into what's happening. You know, that, that's the trade-off of working with APIs. So in this case, we're working with agents. So last year, I uh, started talking with some of the folks at Cisco about bringing official support to some of their platforms. Uh, specifically, we started talking about the 9K and 3K platforms. Um, uh, these these uh, devices run NXOS and iOS XR. Uh, we're working together with Cisco to bring official support to these. And so when I say official support, I mean the Chef client uh, the latest release is going to be available on uh, a variety of platforms, uh, the, the 9300, 9500 series, and the 3K series uh, in Q3 of this year. Uh, officially supported means the Chef agent is going to be built in our CI pipeline, which is, uh, as we're going to see, is, is fairly large and wide. And we're going to be uh, blocking on Cisco just like we would for Windows, just like we would for Red Hat. You know, it's, it's going to be a first class platform. Uh, the way we provide our packages is with a packaging framework called Omnibus. Omnibus is something that uh, we kind of had to create out of necessity. Because we support so many different architectures and so many different platforms, a lot of them have, uh, let's say, uh, elderly packages and elderly versions of, of software that we depend on to run the Chef Agent. So our solution was to build a packaging uh, format called Omnibus. Omnibus allows us to build uh, cross-platform full-stack applications. So in the case of the Chef Agent, we need Ruby, we need OpenSSL, we need a handful of other Ruby libraries, and we need to ensure that we have the exact same Chef experience, whether we're on a, a Nexus switch, or, or whether we're on FreeBSD, or whether we're on Windows 2013 R2. You know, so we have the exact same behavior across them. Uh, what Omnibus does is it builds the full stack of everything, 
and creates a, a, a package for the end device. So RPMs, DEBs, MSIs, DMGs, uh, whatever the format is. Uh, and then the, that package installs into OptChef so we don't interfere with the path of anything else on the system. So Chef is fully self-contained and is not going to interfere with other applications on your system. It brings its own Ruby, it brings a, a freshly patched version of OpenSSL, and we make sure we have, you know, uh, we're not going to affect how you use Ruby or how you use OpenSSL. Um, but that's what uh, Omnibus does. And so we're currently building the Chef client for Nexus uh, on our master branch. Uh, the patches have been upstreamed. Um, we are uh, updating a few of the Chef resources for how we're going to interact with the Nexus uh, devices. Uh, th those resources are things like package. You know, maybe we're not running, uh, maybe we don't have permission to directly install on the file system. So there are a couple jumps we have to hop through. Because we detect which platform we're on and how we're deployed onto that uh, from the node platform or the platform family, we can make decisions as we run the Chef code on the machines. Oh, I'm on a 5K, uh, I'm on a 3K, I'm on a 9K, maybe I behave differently or install things differently depending on which platform I'm on. So we can easily support that all in the Chef cookbook. Uh, so this is a, a quick uh, diagram of our continuous deployment pipeline. Because we have omnibus packages, uh, we have to build for all of our different platforms. It's currently 22 targets, so it's pretty wide uh, and uh, fairly slow. And the fact that you know, we're building for AIX and Solaris and Windows and, and on and on and on. Um, but Cisco will be a tier one platform, and the downloads will be available in all the usual uh, places. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to sort out you know, whether or not it's going to be installed coming out of the factory, but there will be a YUM repository available so you can easily install the Chef packages, uh, as well as support for OmniTruck, which is our, our API for, for downloading packages directly. So uh, the Cisco cookbook is how we're going to be providing resources for managing NXOS uh, directly by, by directly talking to the NX API. The cookbook is currently uh, not open source, but it's up on GitHub. We're working with Cisco and you know, committing to it just like you would any other chef cookbook. Uh, but it's going to abstract away those underlying specifics and as well as provide testing for the resources. So Chef is really big on testing. And, and this is how you can ensure that we get the, the sort of behavior you expect. You know, I say install this package. Did the package get installed? Yes, it did. You know, that sort of stuff. And so the Cisco cookbook has about 20 different resources available to it. Uh, here's a, a quick overview of, of what we're doing so far. This list is not comprehensive. There will be more stuff added. But these are the resources that uh, are currently under development or, or are already supported. <clears throat> and there will be more, package, uh, more resources coming. And this will eventually support multiple different product lines, not just in XOS. Uh, and this is just kind of a, a quick example of, of what it looks like to create an interface uh, you know, on, on a switch. Uh, that's just a Chef uh, resource in action. You know, it's uh, from the README, fairly trivial little example. But people are taking pictures. I'll make the slides downloadable later if you want them. Uh, but the reason, the reason these things are important is, is because Chef is really built on the idea of test-driven infrastructure. You know, you, you've got your infrastructure as code, so everything in your infrastructure is managed like source code. Well, the next thing developers started doing was continuous delivery and continuous improvement, or continuous uh, uh, integration. And, and so if you have your infrastructure as code and you have a lot of tests for your infrastructure, you can start doing tests before you start deploying things. And everything in Chef is versioned, and so you can start pinning things and say, hey, in production we're using 1.2 of, of the Cisco cookbook, uh, and we're running it with these configurations. What would happen if I needed to change the interfaces? Well, let me go ahead and partition out part of my infrastructure to be QA. And in QA, we can unhook the versions and, and you know, go, go nuts and, and start messing around with things. But because you have that, that versioning and the testing, you can be really safe as you start moving forward. So Chef has a lot of testing infrastructure built into it. Uh, we have RuboCop, which is a, a Ruby code analyzer. It looks for stylistic sorts of things. We have Food Critic. Uh, you know, we're, we're clever with the names at Chef. Uh, it's a lint tester for, for testing uh, cookbooks for style to ensure that 
certain conventions are, are adhered to. And then we have unit testing. So unit testing actually goes and says, hey, uh, if you say you're going to do this, we're going to do this. And it just do, does that quick static checking to, to ensure that your, your infrastructure is, is uh, behaving the way you expect. But then we have Test Kitchen. So what Test Kitchen does is it actually stands up infrastructure and runs your cookbooks on those uh, before, uh, before you, you check these things in. So you can say, hey, I, I need to support uh, you know, Wind River, uh, you know, the, the 3Ks, the, the 9Ks, and the 9500s. And uh, I need to have VMs for all those platforms, and I need to test my infrastructure on each of those. Well, Test Kitchen will stand up VMs of all of them, run your cookbooks on them, report back all the tests before you go to your next step in your CI pipeline. So this makes it really easy to, to aggressively move fast. And why would you want to move aggressively fast? Um, continuous delivery is the idea that at any point in time you can be delivering value to your customers. You can be uh, rapidly uh, promoting change across many environments, simultaneously uh, reducing the risk that you would encounter. Because you move faster with smaller changes that are well tested, uh, you know, maybe counterintuitively, it makes it uh, easier to deliver features safely. And so we're really big on the idea of continuous delivery when paired with your networking. And you back that up with infrastructure as code, versioning, and testing, and you start to build very large, comprehensive pipelines that can be deployed across virtual, physical, cloud infrastructure. And so as you start to get into these uh, larger scale deployments, there are going to be different strategies that you can use for how you manage your infrastructure. Uh, you know, if, if you're managing things just with Chef, uh, perhaps you're managing the end switches, maybe you don't have that many, maybe your networking uh, needs are, are fairly uh, uh, simple, so you, you, maybe you're not quite ready for uh, a full-blown SDN controller yet. Uh, well, Chef can manage the individual devices. So right now we're doing kind of the block and tackling of that. We're, we're managing the end devices, and the chef, chef is going to configure them. It's fairly simple. It, you know, it can scale, but, uh, but perhaps you're going to need something that handles more the SDN layer. You know, your Chef is probably not the right tool for handling things like your uh, quality of service, your you know, uh, quickly, quickly changing lots of dynamic infrastructure, uh, networking infrastructure. We're not that tool. A tool for that would be something like ACI, you know, uh, Cisco's application-centric infrastructure. Um, in that case, Chef would probably work in a, a, very, uh, a very good hybrid environment where Chef would manage the individual nodes, ensuring that they have the users, the groups, the packages installed on them, and then getting them ready to be managed by ACI, and then making requests into ACI. Hey, I need this VLAN uh, created, and I'm going to be bringing some VMs into that environment. Can you make sure you handle that with this level of quality of service? It, uh, you want to use the right tools for the right approach. So we're going to be working with the ACI team uh, on, on further integrations for that. So that's kind of how we see you know, the, the trade-offs. Um, Chef is not an SDN controller. You know. uh, and then we also have further Cisco integrations in play. Uh, we've been talking with the UCS folks. There are existing community integrations uh, around UCS Lib, which is a, a Ruby library that talks to the UCS manager uh, API. So uh, with that, we can do things like provision networks, uh, create VMs, install the Chef agent on those VMs, and then manage it from there. So I can actually go to a UCS box and say, knife UCS server create LAMP stack. You know, give, me, give, me a, a, you know, give me a Linux box or give me a Windows box and, and put Chef on it and then manage it from there, which is really nice because essentially UCS becomes a, a hardware cloud. You, know, you could treat it just like any other sort of cloud infrastructure. Uh, we are uh, having talks with the ACI folks. Hopefully, uh, uh, that will prove. Uh, you know, maybe next Cisco Live will be talking about that integration more. Um, and then Chef has, has been involved in the OpenStack uh, uh, project for a long time, and so uh, we've worked with a lot of the different Cisco OpenStack projects, uh, both at deploying OpenStack, but as well as consuming OpenStack resources. So as you're starting to uh, look at different cloud solutions, private cloud, public cloud, Chef is going to support you on pretty much any of them. And, and then when you start working with OpenStack, it becomes really easy to consume a lot of that infrastructure. Whether it's a tool like Knife, which is our command line tool for, for provisioning machines individually. You know, I can say, hey, Knife server create uh, you know, one machine at a time. Or working with uh, a library like Chef Provisioning, where I can say, hey, I need 100 Linux VMs to be spun up. And when those 100 are done, I'm going to spin up 50 more that are going to interact with those. So Chef Provisioning is our orchestration library. 
So uh, that's kind of a, a whirlwind tour of, of Chef and Cisco. Um, I guess I went kind of fast, but it was a short talk. Uh, so does anybody have any questions or anything I can, I can drill down into more? OK. Uh, we're going to be over at the booth later this afternoon, um, I believe at 3 o'clock. If, uh, if, if you need anything, feel free to uh, uh, come talk to me later. Uh, were there any questions? I see the mic roaming around. OK. OK. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much.